Hello, welcome to another episode of Purple Insider. Matthew Collar here, and joining me on the show, returning for the I don't know how many th time, Sam Monson, Pro Football Focus. Sam, we've done this many times together where we've talked about football and the Minnesota Vikings, but how many times have we talked when Delvin Cook was not a Viking? Probably not that many. Uh, it is uh, throughout the day kind of hitting me that most of my career covering the Vikings has always had him as the running back, always had Adam Thielen as the receiver, always had Eric Hendricks at linebacker, and uh, it is a new day in Minnesota now. Yeah, it's the first time in a long time, probably the first time we've ever done one of these where I think the general analysis is going to be something different, right? It's going to be they're not just doing the same thing over and over again. They're not just changing names, but realistically, it's the same approach. They do appear to actually be changing direction and, and doing something different. And that in itself, I think, is like is reason to celebrate because it's it's interesting if nothing else folks i've been wearing oakley's now for a few weeks and let me tell you there is a reason that justin jefferson and a bunch of other football players wear these things because they are awesome i've got the matte black prism sapphire polar sunglasses on and i've been doing all sorts of summer things with them i've been hitting golf balls in the water jogging playing basketball getting sunburned but my eyes are in good shape i have been missing out on this experience for a long time. They are so comfortable. I can wear them all day and never get tired of having them on. Oakley is changing the game and it's time for you to discover a whole new world of possibilities with your eyewear. They are suited for everyday eyewear with frames and lenses, allowing you for to be an extension of yourself, an expression of your personality more than meets the eye. So make a sunglasses upgrade now at oakley.com. Oakley offers prism lens technology, what the heck is that, you ask? Well, I'm looking through it right now. It is a proprietary technology to Oakley and available for everyday settings as well. If you want to know more, and I know you do, go to oakley.com and do your own research. And while you're at it, get yourself a pair of everyday glasses that will be sure to change your look for the better. When you wear Oakley, there really is more than meets the eye. Try it for yourself. I've worn sunglasses in the past, and I can assure you that Oakley is the best looking and best quality out there. So go on over to oakley.com for more information today. Oakley, express your style and build a look that's made for you. Well, there's a lot of different ways that we could go, but I guess that that is a, a good open door to talk about how you feel about the overall direction, because you're right. So many times you and I have had the discussion of like, what should they be doing to get over the top after signing Kirk? And the answer was always like, I don't know stop the run better or something. There was always some get a guard. I'm not sure. Uh, but now we have this whole new roster of all new faces. And it feels like Kwesi Adafo Mensa has taken the reins of this team. And so my question to you is how should Vikings fans feel about that? Yeah. And, and for years, it's been a case of, you know, they just need to do something different. Like what they're doing isn't bad. It's, it's giving them reasonable results, but clearly it's not going to take them where they want to go. You know, they, they had this approach basically since what the 2017 NFC championship game of, we almost made it that one time. So let's try and sort of keep everything more or less where it was. And hopefully we'll get back there eventually it's time to pull the plug on that, right? Like we, I think we've established at this point that that is not going to be the strategy that sends you back there. So they have to do something different. And I think they acknowledge that from an ownership point of view, which is why they, you know, shipped the old regime out and brought in the new regime. And I think it disappointed a lot of people when sort of year one of that first regime didn't really change anything in terms of direction and approach and, you know, how they were going about things. Obviously, it resulted in a, a lot of wins and that run last year, but it still sort of felt like that was just the same old story again um, that was inevitably, you know, you just caught the high end of variance for a while in terms of in-game situations. But fundamentally, as long as things were the same from a personnel standpoint, from a team management standpoint, you know, we were going to regress this year or we were going to end up back kind of back at the same starting point. But this is really the first time where there is clear evidence of something different happening. And Dalvin Cook, I think, is just the latest example of that, but is far from the only one. Obviously, they already 
uh, traded away Zadarius Smith. There's talk that Danelle Hunter is on the, the, the trade block as well, albeit there's been that talk for a long time. It looks like they are sort of working through systematically and ridding themselves of the most onerous contracts on the roster, right? And sort of trying to take this thing in a different direction and probably from a baseline cap management standpoint. So let's talk about what they could have done instead, because I think that that's important to discuss. And I've seen only a little bit of this from fans on Twitter of just like, hey, you know, what what is going on here? I mean, there was 13 wins last year. Shouldn't you restructure contracts? Shouldn't you take another swing at it? Shouldn't you just improve the defense? But you can't copy and paste last year onto this year and have a better defense. Right. If you could, wow, what a world it would be. Uh, but you can't. Uh, so if they could rerun last year with Ed Donatel fired and maybe another few defensive players, then it would be magical. But um, that's that can't happen. Things change. Players get older. Schedules get harder. Uh, but was there any other route? Like after winning 13 games, is there any argument that they should have tried to keep these players around kind of at all costs to the future and tried to run it back? Because you can still say... Uh, and this is not what I think, but you can, that the NFC is sort of open and up for grabs. Right. And, you know, maybe you're foregoing an opportunity to be the team that again, catches maybe the right side of variance and can beat some mediocre good teams in the NFC. I mean, I think each individual case, you always have to take it on its merits, right? So the, the Dalvin Cook conversation is a different conversation to the, the, the Zadaria Smith conversation. And I think you kind of have each one in isolation and come to that conclusion i personally would have been fine with trying to keep sedaria smith around for another year and and trying to make something happen with that defensive line i think dalvin cook we've just reached the inevitable conclusion of what happens when you have a running back on that kind of contract like they are always going to be one of the first names that is is just front and center for a, a general manager or a personnel guy of that's a number we've got to get rid of. Like we just, we can't have that. And it doesn't matter. And and it's, it's sort of unfortunate for running backs in, you know, just another way that they get screwed in the NFL, but it's the kind of number that let's say Philadelphia was carrying that Dalvin cook contract this year. The Eagles could talk themselves into carrying that, right? Because they just made the super bowl. That roster looks like one of the best in the NFL. Again, the, the, the talent that Dalvin Cook has and the lack of holes elsewhere, you could kind of convince yourself that, you know what, it's worth it. It's it's expensive. In an ideal world, we're not dealing with this contract, but it's not worth cutting him. We're not going to get traded to anybody. Let's let's keep him for another year and figure it out in the offseason. I think the Vikings are demonstrating a pretty good level of self-awareness with this whole approach, not just with Dalvin Cook, but with – everything so far that they've done this offseason it it sort of speaks to what <clears throat> what a couple of teams have done in recent years which is probably overachieved and clearly recognized that and gone about things you know that offseason in a way that doesn't do what you were talking about which is let's just try and you know we're we're a player away let's just run it back and add that player and we're good the bengal's did this a couple of years ago where they you know they they went on that run with a terrible offensive line with Joe Burrow, the best quarterback in the NFL under pressure. And instead of thinking, well, if we can do that every year, we're, we're fine. We don't need to invest in the offensive line. It's good. They spent that entire off off season overhauling the offensive line, you know, acutely aware that you can't do that year after year. The chargers did it the season before that, you know, Justin Herbert played out of his mind under pressure. And instead of saying, well, we've got a quarterback that can play amazingly under pressure, they overhauled their offensive line. So I think the Vikings have done a good job of understanding that, look, last season was great, but you don't win 11 straight one score games every year. It's, it's, you know, it's not feasible. It's completely unrealistic. So they kind of recognize that this was probably not as good as the team as, as the record last season. So let's approach it as if that never really happened. And let's actually move this in the direction that we would have moved it if we'd won, you know, nine or 10 games and been relatively disappointing and kind of, you know, bombed out the, the way that potentially the talent said they should have. Yeah. I think that what makes it so interesting is that in this case, it's a team that won not just 
you know, 10 games or nine games, even though that's probably who they really were, but 13 to put you in the division win and right up there going into the last couple of weeks where they have a chance to win the entire conference. And then you turn around and tear so many pieces apart. I also think that this is the type of thinking that they were looking for. They were looking to move on from kind of the old scout who was going to say, well, we just need a a run defense and then we'll do it um, to project forward. And, And that's the real sort of thing that you're always trying to do is look into your crystal ball as a general manager and see what's coming next and then act accordingly. And what's coming next, maybe in some other alternate universe could have been the Super Bowl for the Vikings. But you know what? No one really thinks that. And Vegas doesn't think that. And the, an eight and a half win team before, uh, you know, they cut Dalvin Cook and they are what the 15th best Super Bowl odds or something. And, and they would have projections that are probably even sharper than Vegas about where other teams are, where they are and where you know they are expected to go from here. But my question is now that it's kind of over with Cook and we've kind of hit this real, real rebuildy type of mode. And if they move on from Hunter, then that's like all the way yeah. gas pedal all the way down on rebuild mode. Uh, how do you get back? from where they are, because that's the big question. Like going down is always the easy <laughs> part. It's always coming back up. That, that is the issue. So if you're Kwesi Adafo Mensa, like what has to be next from taking apart a lot of this roster? And also they still do have some very important key, really good players. So this can't be a thing that lasts for a really long time. No, and, and obviously, you know, if this is the time where they're kind of putting a stop date on the Kirk Cousins run, it begins and ends realistically with quarterback, you know, and, that, and that's the problem is that that is not necessarily easy to identify that next quarterback and to even get yourself in a position to get the next quarterback. I mean, look at the the Houston Texans this offseason, right? Like we say, it's really easy to to take it apart and to, to tank essentially and to collapse and to go for that and put yourself in a position where you're the worst team in the NFL. The Texans did it and still screwed it up. Like they, they won a game and took themselves out of the, the first overall pick And, you know, if you believe the reports, that cost them their number one guy. It sounds like they wanted Bryce Young first and foremost, and then they didn't have a shot at Bryce Young. So C.J. Stroud was their next guy, their their backup option. But, you know, for all the tanking that they did over the course of like two years, they still somehow managed to screw up getting the shot at the one guy that it sounds like they wanted the most. So it's not going to be easy to to get yourself back on track because the quarterback is the thing you're going to be finding. And that's what everybody is chasing in the NFL as well, particularly in this era where, you know, with the greatest respect, Kirk Cousins isn't going to cut it. You know, and if, if you find a guy like Kirk Cousins in the draft, number one, you've done well, that's not easy in, in itself, but it's also not enough. Like you need something better than that. And that's why, you know, the Colts this year, swung for Anthony Richardson because they think, look, he's, he's a project. He's, there's a lot wrong with him. He wasn't even a particularly good college player, but he's the most athletic quarterback to enter the league ever. And we're now in a conference with Patrick Mahomes and Joe Burrow and Josh Allen and Justin Herbert and Trevor Lawrence. And like, we need somebody who, whose range of outcomes includes knocking off two or three of those guys sequentially in the playoffs. And if that isn't the case, then the quarterback we get, doesn't do us any good so they're in a tough spot but i think part of the the project or part of the process is building up the kind of ammunition to do a couple of things number one potentially put yourself in a position that isn't where you belong in the draft and that's what you know philadelphia have done in the last couple of years chicago has been doing now is there's where you started off with in terms of win loss record and where that puts you in the pecking order. And then there's where you can get to based off the capital that you've accumulated. And then the other thing is having the kind of cap space and and money to deploy resources if, and when you find that guy, right. And it might not be the draft, you know, there are sometimes a situation arises where all of a sudden a quarterback emerges as a veteran option that you hadn't even considered before and if you don't have the ammunition ready to pull the trigger, you can't get that guy. But, you know, we're, we may be focusing on the draft, but next year something could happen and, and all, you know, and a veteran quarterback that they hadn't even considered actually turns out to be an option. But if and when you get that guy, you now need to be able to flip the switch and start spending money and 
build a team around that guy like in an off season, as opposed to, well, we got the quarterback now, but it's going to take two more years before we can put anything around him. Cause we just traded away everything. Yeah, and that's why this seems like, and, and I hate to put it this way only because it feels like it's so far off. And if you're a Vikings fan, I don't know if you know this, Sam, it's been a while, you know, th- th- it's been a long time since this team's made the Super Bowl. There's been some close calls and uh, these folks are impatient. In fact, they've also had to watch the Twins lose every time they get in the playoffs, the Wild lose, the Timberwolves lose. I mean, it's an angsty fan base that wants to win. So when you tell them, hey, I could see this three-year plan, like what three-year plan? What? You just won 13 games. I totally understand that reaction. But if you're Quasi at Alfomensa and you have your contract and your timeline that you probably presented to ownership from the time you took the job, knowing that a lot of these guys were old and expensive and they were going to have to go eventually. The timeline that makes sense to me, at least as of now, when they have not extended Kirk Cousins, would be that you go through this year, you try to draft a quarterback if you can in the first round and probably are prepared to trade a lot of draft capital because you've been spending it at all the other positions, receiver, all the draft picks on defense and everything else. And ideally you draft the quarterback, he starts, you develop from for a year and then you go buck wild in free agency the next year to build around him and you kind of have a three-year timeline here. That does not sound like the most fun thing ever. Uh, you're still going to have Justin Jefferson Presumably, if he doesn't, uh, you know, force his way out, which he can't really. So I'm right. not too worried about that. But, um, you know, I, I think that these years could be a little rocky over the next uh, couple of seasons. But it's almost like you got to ask people to kind of look down the road quite a ways for a fan base that doesn't really want to, I think. Yeah, I, I think last year, in, in a funny way, just kind of put off the inevitable. Like they probably came in with this plan that what you just described is sort of what they would want to do to this roster, but it was too good to do that right away. And then became even harder to do that once they started winning all these games. And all of a sudden it's a 13 win team. And now you're like, ah, that's it's a little difficult to sell anybody on the idea of just tear the whole thing down right now. So as, as good as last season was, and as fun as the run was, it, it probably just postponed what needs to actually happen to this team. Uh, but the other thing is like, we've been, We've been saying similar things like this for a long time. I think if anything, it's only getting harder because of the influx of quarterbacks, you know, into the league. We we had a period where the Tom Brady's and the Peyton Manning's and, and those guys were kind of fading, <clears throat> fading out of the league, reaching the end of their careers. And they hadn't yet been replaced by the next wave. And it, it was maybe we were going to go through another lean period where if you just get yourself a good quarterback, you're immediately in the top five contenders in the NFL. And then in the in the matter of a couple of years, you get all those guys that we talked about, the Mahomes, Burrow, you know, all of them come into the league in, in a space of three or four years. And now you're it might be tougher than it's ever been to um, to get that kind of contending team. The good news for Minnesota, though, is that they're in the NFC and it, that's a fraction of the the kind of loaded status of the AFC where, you know, you would have to. I mean, that's like I said, the Colts looked at that landscape and said, if we pick a quarterback and he's a top 10 guy, that's useless to us, you know, because all like eight of the other guys in the top 10 are ahead of him. So and they're in the same conference and we're going to have to beat three of those at minimum to get through to a Super Bowl. So if you're Minnesota, at least getting that, you know, look at San Francisco last year. I mean, Brock Purdy played really well at the end of the season, but the totality of their quarterback situation you know, it was not exactly a, a massive plus, and yet they got to the NFC Championship game before completely running out of quarterbacks uh, because the rest of the roster was really good, right? So, you know, Minnesota, if they can find some kind of Kirk Cousins successor, successor or heir, immediately can become an NFC contender, even if that's still a long way from, you know, being able to go toe-to-toe with the Kansas City Chiefs or, or whoever the true best teams in the NFL are at that point. But I think that what we did learn from last year, though, in seeing Philadelphia and and who they were is just, I mean, so much is about the quarterback. Of course it is. It's always going to be Mahomes won the Super Bowl and it's Tom Brady winning every Super Bowl and Manning and Roethlisberger dominating the AFC always will be. But if you're in the conference that doesn't have that, like the AFC, 
And I mean, my gosh, whoever goes to the Super Bowl is going to be say, see, we had a elite quarterback, everyone in the AFC, because right. they all do all the contenders. But if you're in the NFC, it truly is going to come down to who has the best top to bottom roster, at least for a few years. If Bryce Young becomes great, I don't know. But even Stroud and Richardson went to the AFC. So that becomes more loaded potentially if those guys work out. And the NFC is still kind of uh, fluttering around with a handful of very good quarterbacks. But if San Francisco can dominate the conference and Philadelphia, who clearly had a great team top to bottom, but there's always going to be somebody on their timeline that's building up a stacked roster. This is how the Rams end up with Jared Goff in the Super Bowl or Nick Foles in the Super Bowl or Jalen Hurts, who I think is very, very good. But look what is around him. It's fantastic. Or Brock Purdy, one step away. It's always these, these completely stacked rosters. Those don't happen by signing Michael Pierce. And I like Michael Pierce. I do. And I like, you know, a lot of the guys that they've signed, like Harrison Phillips and so forth, but that's not how you get there. I mean, you got to get there with great players across the board. It can't just be, well, let's bring in one guy to stuff the run a little bit better because we weren't that good at that last year and we need to improve on that small part. It's like, if you're going to increase the odds that you hit on that quarterback you draft, What's around him has to be a great supporting cast. And I think we really saw that with both of those NFC championship quarterbacks last year. Yeah. And I think the Eagles are a great example of how you don't need to do anything crazy. You know, you don't need to have this revolutionary strategy or, or you know, crazy money ball technique to make this happen. You just need to not screw up for a period of time. Right. And admittedly, like the Eagles have done a good job of, generally focusing in the smart areas or where you would say is are smart areas they've always invested in that defensive line you know they they try and run seven deep if they can and get guys that can get pressure across the board and just keep reloading and reloading and reloading um and then they try and make sure they have a good offensive line and when that team is really good they get it they sort of stumble into a good secondary as well right and that hasn't always been the case and when the eagles aren't as good it tends to be when the secondary isn't great but the other thing they've done well is, you know, they're they don't let a mistake put them off trying again. Like they made for as good as they a, a job as they've done, and you know, every off season it's like, wow, Howie Roseman, how does he do it? What does he like? They drafted Jalen Rager over Justin Jefferson. That's one of the biggest single screw ups that any team has made in the last five years. And they came back the next year and they went, all right, we screwed that up. Let's get Devontae Smith. And then the Devontae Smith thing, you know, year one was good, but he wasn't like blow the doors off. So screw it. Let's go trade a first round pick for AJ Brown and really fix this day. Like they could have gone completely in the tank after the Jalen Rager mess up and gone, wow, we just, we made a complete mess of that. Let's stay away from wide receiver. Let's throw the resources somewhere else. But they went, no, we need, we still need it. We didn't get it right. We need to keep going again and, and made it happen. And the Jalen Hurts thing is another, like, he was, he's not supposed to be their quarterback. Carson Wentz was supposed to be the guy ushering in this era of Philadelphia dominance. And they drafted Jalen Hurts, you know, in the second round, basically just as, as a contingency plan. And even when they got him and Wentz sort of blew up and they had to get rid of him, they didn't commit to Jalen Hurts right away. They traded for future first round picks as a hedge. And it's like, all right, we'll give Jalen Hurts a shot. But if he, if he goes south, We've got multiple first round picks ready to jump up in the draft and go get another quarterback if that goes to hell as well. So I think the Eagles really are a great template or a great, um, you know, example for Minnesota of what you can do if you just don't make mistakes. You know, if you just generally speaking, keep it on the fairway and quickly address the mistakes that you do make. You know, if you do a Jalen Rager, if you grab a guy in the first round and he's obviously a disaster right away. Go and fix it. Go find another guy because you got it wrong. You got to get that. Like there was a reason you picked that guy in the first round in the first place. He probably needed him to come in and do something. And if he doesn't, you got to take another shot. And be in financial position to make the AJ Brown trade and to pay sure. AJ Brown. And this is something I've been thinking about a lot. That is one of the, I think things I've never seen the Vikings do since covering them uh, is actually not hurt themselves for the future with their salary cap by right. moving on from Adam Thielen when they did and taking kind of the hit and not June 1st thing, that thing, they made it better for the future, but not for the immediate. And they could have restructured Brian O'Neill to keep Delvin cook, but they decided, no, we're not going to do that. We are not going to 
harm ourselves. They could have put more po- money in the pocket of Zadarius Smith because that's what he was looking for at the end of the day. He was looking for more cash. Sure. Do not blame him. Same. But they weren't willing to do that. <laughs> right. Yeah, we all are. But uh, they were not willing to put more cash in his pocket to hurt themselves down the road for the future cap. So when you get to next year or you get to two years from now, because the Kirk situation complicates that and you can be the team that adds your AJ Brown or whoever it might be. That's why I think where they stand now, if you look across the offense, all the guys that are going to be here are young. I think O'Neal's going to be great for years to come. Darisaw, and we'll see on Jordan Addison, but that's a first round pick who could be very, very good. Justin Jefferson, the other offensive linemen, they're all young. Their running backs are now all young. So there's a couple of years potentially with those guys. So the offense is set up for a quarterback to potentially drop in there and then spend the rest to fill whatever pieces you didn't find in the draft. Like th- that's what I like about this off season for them is I get it. There have been a lot of off seasons right. where I've been like, I don't know, man, I don't really get it. You're signing Chandon Sullivan. Is this really a thing you want to do to yourself? You know, I, it just, is that really like a fix for you is to bring back Mackenzie Alexander or whatever, you know, and, or to trade for Yannick and Gakwe. This, it feels conducive to me. Yeah, like, so, you know, there's a lot of different ways now in the NFL of managing the salary cap. And the Vikings have always been on that kind of New Orleans Saints end of the spectrum in terms of sort of maxing out the credit card, paying it down, and then recycling, blah, blah, blah. And there are teams that do it in the other direction. And honestly, I don't know that either one is necessarily dramatically better or worse than others. Like, as long as you understand how to manage it, it's fine. But what the other way of doing it does give you is the flexibility to capitalize on the unforeseen things, the unforeseen opportunities that nobody sees coming. And A.J. Brown is a good one. Tyreek Hill, you know, these kinds of moves where like nobody was looking at that 12 months in advance and saying A.J. Brown's on his way out of Tennessee or Tyreek Hill is going to be gone from Kansas City. Those were not moves that anybody expected to happen until we got much closer. And all of a sudden it's like, wow, that it's actually going to happen. And if you didn't plan on that, you weren't in a position to make it happen. Or if you didn't automatically have yourself that kind of reserve sitting there, you can't be in the market. So it's one. And and the draft capital, I think, is another thing as well. We always focus on what it allows you to do in the draft, you know, move up, move down, all those kinds of things. But having, you know, a surplus of fifth round picks and stuff allows you to go and trade for players like, you know, Calais Campbell or, or whoever it is or those kinds of things, you know, when veteran players that, and again, that, that comes with the salary attached to it. Right. Or, I mean, the, the Zadaria Smiths of the world, you know, those kinds of players, like be on the other side of that and be able to go, you know what, this is actually good value for us. Cause we've got a, the rest of our roster is in a really good spot. We can take on that contract. We can flip a low draft pick for this guy and bring him into the, the the equation instead of getting rid of him to try and tidy up the salary cap. Like it just gives you so much flexibility to be able to tinker with the roster or add massive, you know, sea change moves because nobody saw it coming. And all of a sudden the guy is available and you just don't have the resources to make it happen because you've kind of maxed out the credit card before that point. Right. And that's why when anybody comes available and the fan base goes, should we be in on that guy? And it's like, you can't be in on that guy. You're not in on that guy. How would you ever pay that guy? And uh, that's been where they have stood forever. I mean, I I think that what, you know, I brought up Michael Pierce. I think he's the guy that they paid out the biggest contract to free agency that was not already in house since 2017 or whatever, since Kirk got here. I mean, that's just not a major acquisition and they were never really able to get that star player who's on the market because of that. Whereas, you know, when the Browns create all that cap space, they get Amari Cooper for a fifth because somebody else has to give them away. You want to be on the other side of getting the Sidarius eventually yeah. when it's your time to do so, which might not be next year or it might, depending on you know where they stand with the quarterback situation. That's where the Kirk extension talk kind of comes into this. Like, could that be a thing? Um, but I don't know that it's going to be or not. I did want to um, change the subject slightly, though, surrounding Delvin Cook's exit and to ask you about Vikings running back history, because you are an aficionado of uh, Vikings history. So compare him to Barry Word. No, to Terry Allen. No, uh, just kidding. But there have been a lot of great names that have come through in Vikings history. So there's always the Mount Rushmore conversation, but I feel like this Mount Rushmore is pretty easy. 
So maybe it's a ranking that is required here because it's Chuck Foreman, Adrian Peterson, Robert Smith, Delvin Cook. I don't know if anyone else gets into that conversation, but where do you, where do you place him? Do you place him ahead of Robert Smith in the same discussion as Adrian Peterson way behind Adrian Peterson? Kind of, how do you, how do you weigh that? Yeah, I think he is ahead of Robert Smith. Um, and I think he is behind Adrian Peterson, but that's probably the ranking. Like the, it's it, your ranking probably goes Adrian Peterson is a clear number one. Um, Dalvin might be number two, but I think those three are the next group. And, and Robert Smith is probably the bottom one of that group, even though I think Smith could have maybe been a better player than he ended up being if he'd, if he'd had the, the right run. But Dalvin Cook at his best is one of those genuinely transcendent running backs who does make everything around him better. You know, there were a ton of plays where you turn on and he gets 10 yards when he only had any business getting four, you know, and he like there's a big there's a significant difference between him and Alexander Madison as much as they've done a good job of ensuring they have a solid backup and a transition plan. Even in the last couple of years, there's. Madison breaks more tackles on average, but there's a notable difference in production between when Dalvin Cook carries the ball and when Madison carries the ball. And, you know, he's extremely good at maximizing the space that's there. He's cut out for the modern NFL in terms of quickness, um, you know, burst through a, a tight space, all those kinds of things. He is a really, really good running back. And unfortunately, I think kind of a product of the way that the position is now, which is, you're like you're one and a half contracts and then you're out you know or you're we're onto a next guy or we're trying to get cheaper or younger or a combination of both it's very very difficult now i think for a guy to have an adrian peterson like career where you, you you're around that long and at that level because as soon as that contract gets that high you're immediately looking for ways to get rid of the guy yeah. And I think, I mean, Adrian is just in a different air from almost anyone to ever play the game. Right. I think if right. you start talking about who are the best running backs of all time, Adrian's name comes up pretty quickly into that conversation. Whereas I think there's been a lot of Delvin cooks who at their best are lightning. I mean, think about like the Larry Johnson's, the Sean Alexander's, the Chris Johnson's, I mean, who had these burst on the scene, unbelievable seasons, people buy their jerseys, they end up on Madden covers, everyone loves them. And then three years from now, you're like, hey, what happened to that guy who was really good a couple of years ago? And I think, you know, the other part is when it comes to Robert Smith versus Delvin Cook, the stops and starts with Delvin Cook, I think made it tricky for me to put him ahead of Robert Smith. I mean, in part because it was like 2017, he comes out on the scene and whoa, oh my gosh, this is the next great franchise quarterback ACL tear. 2018 right. is very uneven for him kind of coming back from that injury. 2019 first half MVP. Oh my gosh. Second half. Oh, he's kind of banged up. 2020. Oh my gosh. MVP second half. Oh, he's kind of banged up. And then 2021 and 2020 and the PFF grades would show you this and a number of other stats. It's very average as far as what he did for them, if not a little below at times. And so I feel like it was like this really sort of brief when it was great. Oh my goodness. It was great. And every team, every team's defense spent their whole week scared of the Delvin cook home run. It was something to behold. But it was almost Percy Harvin like where it just didn't last very long. Yeah. But one thing I think that does not necessarily separate him from Robert Smith, but give him a big advantage is Robert Smith was typically running behind a really good offensive line. And then for a while was also the kind of beneficiary of that insane passing attack that opened up a ton of space for that dominant offensive line to then pave the way for him to have a, a ton of production. So you know, Dalvin Cook generally was running behind some pretty rough offensive lines and not always, you know, as part of a, an overwhelming offense or anything. So I, I think Robert Smith tended to have a much better situation around him than Dalvin did. I can buy that. I can buy that. And, and as far as career numbers go, it's fairly even. Uh, Robert Smith has about a thousand more rushing yards, but Delvin has 15 more touchdowns. They average almost the same amount of yards per attempt. Delvin averaged more yards. 
Uh, neither one of them set the world on fire as a receiving back. Maybe Robert Smith was a little bit better at that. Both of them very exciting to watch. I mean, Robert Smith is one of the fastest players, maybe in NFL history. Um, so it's incredible with this team, their running back and wide receiver lineage. And Delvin Cook is with no doubt a part of that. I just, uh, before we wrap up, I, I want to ask for some for some quick takes here. Because it's as funny as it is to talk about the rebuild and all this the different things that they're doing and roster reset, uh, they could win the division. <laughs> it's, yeah. it's possible. So I, I need I, I just want I just want to take on each one of these division teams uh, because I, I think all of them are really up in the air. So give me uh, give me Lions like you've spent your whole life watching the Lions be bad. <laughs> Uh, are you uh, are you biting kneecaps and uh, drinking giant coffees and I don't know running through walls? Like, uh, what, what's your feeling on the lines? I do think they're moving in the right direction pretty well, pretty steadily. Um, they're another team that, that's had this kind of multi year project. It was pretty clear that there was a, a an obvious step by step process here, and another team that they didn't get everything right. You know that some of the players that they drafted along this process that were supposed to be kind of key cornerstones of this whole thing didn't work out and they've had to go in a different direction. And that's part of, I think, doing this good job of roster management is understanding when you made a mess and fixing it so that it doesn't like throw the entire project sideways. But overall, I think they've done a really good job. And, and Ben Johnson in particular as offensive coordinator, I think he was the like the assistant coach of the year last year. Some of the stuff that he was doing play calling wise was he was just consistently a step ahead of the guy trying to call defenses against him. I think it's he's basically the reason why, you know, Lions fans think Jared Goff is like a top five quarterback and anyone that watches him that isn't wearing Lions colors is like, come on, let's, you know, style it back a little bit. Um, but they're good. I mean, they should be the favorite, I think, for this division now with with Aaron Rodgers out of Green Bay. Are you buying a Justin Fields big jump forward? A little bit, yeah. I mean, Justin Fields was set up to fail last year. And the fact that he didn't fail, I think, is a pretty strong you know, feather in his cap. He won that job with zero help around him. In fact, they had systematically removed all the help from him. And he still went out there and showed enough admittedly, you know, mostly as a runner, as a, as an athlete, more than a quarterback, but you know, one did enough to say, all right, now give me some help and let's see what we can do. Um, and you know, we've now seen a few quarterbacks in recent years where they came in, they had tools, they were raw, but in particular, they were really athletic and bought themselves time to develop. And that's another, like Jalen hurts is the perfect example. His PFF grades, I forget what the exact numbers are, but like year one, it was 55, year two, it was sort of 67, 70, and then year three was the big jump to 85. But if he couldn't run, he never would have made it to year three. They would have had him out of there. He wouldn't have made it past year, you know, maybe not past year one, but certainly not past year two. Same thing with Fields. Like he's bought himself the next year, and now he has DJ Moore, and that offensive line was improving, and, you know, he's got some chance now. And we we saw in college that he's got the arm. He's got the accuracy. He can deliver passes to anywhere in the field. He just needs to get comfortable as a passer, as a pocket player, and develop that part of his game. So I would expect some kind of pretty big jump this year. Yeah, I'm on the fence. I'm on the fence. The one thing is hanging out of the ball too long and getting sacked always concerns me because I just don't know if it goes away. Uh, right. You know, so it's like the one thing Josh Allen always had going for him is he just didn't take those sacks. So when you try to like make those comparisons, he was always good at getting rid of the football. I'm still worried about that with Justin Fields. And I think he can make big time throws, but sometimes they're just because he's hanging on and hanging on, and hanging on and then getting sacked. Yeah. But I mean, it's also right? I mean, there are players that that are really good players that skew towards that end of the spectrum. I mean, Aaron mm -hmm. Rodgers always took more sacks than he should have given his yeah. ability, but that was just, that's part of his game, right? Is he's always preferred holding onto the ball, taking a few sacks that he shouldn't at the expense of, I'm going to throw like less interceptions than anybody else in NFL history. You know what I mean? So there's, there's a give and take there. And I think you're probably right that fields will always skew towards that end of things. And, even stripping out the kind of scramble stuff, you know, all those guys are going to have longer average time to throws and guys that don't leave the pocket. But even if you kind of control for those things, I think he will probably hold on to the ball longer than he should most of the time. But if he can, you know, develop as a passer, it's a, it's like a, 
kind of flaw to his game that you might think is fine. Like it's a, it's a, you know, it's just a weakness to what he does, but the rest of it is what's going to determine whether he succeeds or fails. PFF's Monson says Fields, the next Rogers, is actually going to be the headline here for this episode. Speaking of which, like it. how many years of you watching football in your life have you watched where the Green Bay Packers did not have Brett Favre or Aaron Rodgers? And is it zero? Yeah, really. I mean, how certainly crazy is that? Any kind of serious watching, it would be zero. Like, it, that's I mean, look at the run. Your early nineties to now has been one of those two guys effectively for the entirety of, of the whole thing. And what's so wild is that Rogers then went and completely replicated the entire Brett Favre career loop. Like he did the the, the great play, you know, didn't get as many championships as you think he should have. Um kind of wore out his welcome, like just got fed up of how everything went war out was welcome to the point where eventually the team not him decided you know what it's now i don't we're done we're not doing this dance again we've decided you're going this year and then he goes to the jets like the whole thing is insane it's bizarre what a uh, in fact we've talked about how hard it is to find the next vikings quarterback we forgot that it's going to happen next year and it's just going to be aaron Rodgers after the, <laughs> the jets thing goes south um but yeah and it's wild and then that 10 years from now that. he instead of a volleyball arena is it'll be some like health wellness scam that he gets in trouble for <laughs> with the government. Right. right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Sorry. Did you want to say things about the actual Packers? I don't know. No, I just, I I'm still <laughs> sort of blown away by how completely they've completed the time as a flat circle thing, but yeah, you're right now. Now we get to see a new quarterback for the first time. And you know, Jordan love has kind of been set off on a, a weird footing where, okay. The Packers decide, right. We're getting rid of Rodgers. It's time. Jordan loves your team. And then immediately like undermine him by saying, you know what? We're not going to pick up your fifth year option. You're going to have to sign this weird, like small money contract extension because we don't even have any faith in you that you're going to be good. And by the way, good luck this year. You know, it's a, it's kind of a bizarre way of approaching that. Well, and also, I mean, they didn't really go get him any receivers of significance Again, either. Yeah. And so it's just like, do you guys realize that Rodgers was the reason that everyone became, I mean, Devontae Adams is amazing, but you know what I mean? Like anybody can become the best version of themselves with an all-time great quarterback. I don't know if Romeo Dobbs, I, I, I like some of the stuff I saw from Christian Watson, but does that mean he's going to be an elite receiver or something? I don't know. I'm not willing to say that. I would have thought that they would have put all their effort into just sticking it to Rodgers and trying to make him the most happy <laughs> by spending every yeah. dollar they had. I mean, they drafted a receiver, but aside from that, they didn't really go all in on that position. Yeah, they've um, they drafted a few. They they took an interesting approach to it. They they've got a really young receiving core, kind of top to bottom. Um, and I I think there's some merit to the idea of look, Christian Watson showed some stuff last year. I think there was substance to the Romeo Dobbs hype as much as it kind of got out of control. And, you know, it's like, oh, he's going to be the next Devontae Adams. Forget Christian Watson. There's probably something to the idea that he's going to emerge as a pretty useful starting receiver for them. It was just, you know, he was a fourth round pick. It's going to take more than like training camp for him to get it together. But then the entire approach to the draft this year, they kind of went, well, if we've got a need, we're going to draft two or three guys at that position and maximize the chances that somebody is going to emerge and take that gig. So they drafted multiple tight ends. They drafted, they ended up drafting, I think, three wide receivers, certainly two, um, I think three. So if one of those guys sticks, you know, and becomes their slot option or their third receiver, then it's, it's, it's a win. If one of the tight ends emerges, you know, I think they did it to, um, the defensive line as well. Like they, they had sort of three or four spots where they're like, we need an impact player or somebody from the draft to contribute. We're just going to keep swinging at all these spots and hope that, you know, maximize the chances. So, yeah, I think you would like to have seen them add like a clear, obvious veteran upgrade at receiver and not doing so. I mean, it's at least another piece of evidence in the direction of, you know what, we're not 100 percent sure you're the guy. So we're not going to go and get you, you know, a stud wide receiver, even if there were any this offseason, which to be fair, there weren't like the options were available to them were Jacoby Myers, you know, so if you didn't think Jacoby Myers was going to move the needle for your wide receiver core, they're probably fine. Just keeping the powder dry and hoping that the young guys take a step forward. But it is it's an unusual situation he's stepping into of not just replacing a legend, you know, and trying to continue this run of quarterbacks, but 
you're doing it without a ton of help and with the team immediately sort of saying, you know, it would be nice if you were great, but we don't have a ton of faith in it. So we're, we're not even going to pick up your fifth year option. And I always wonder where the bar is. I mean, you mentioned like fields. Clearly the bar was show us that you're pretty great at running and then enough to where we think you can improve and enough leadership that our guys believe in you. And we will forego Bryce Young for that. Okay, wow. Right. I mean, clearly he got over that bar by winning like three games. Uh, but is it wins for Jordan Love? Is it stats for Jordan Love? Is it vibes? Is it like, how are you grading this and evaluating it to decide? And and your point is completely valid on not going out and getting a free agent receiver. There has to be someone. Although, you know, you had your like Odell Beckham and now DeAndre Hopkins or something. Uh, I guess they could have gone all in on something like that. But most, for the most part, absolutely true that free agent wide receivers are costing a ton. So you might as well just keep drafting a bunch of them. I, I'm just really fascinated by both fields and love this year and what it is that they have to do for their teams to keep them because Chicago yeah. didn't do it this year, but they certainly could do it next year and move on from fields. And so I, I don't know how they're evaluating. Do we have our guy or not? I think it really comes, I mean, you termed it vibes. I think it's a little bit more sophisticated than that, but it's the, it's that idea, right? It's like, do you actually buy into the idea that this guy can become something really good down the line? And, you know, for Chicago last year, it was never going to be about wins. It was never gonna necessarily going to be about stats, but Fields showed a, a dynamism, a playmaking ability, and the capacity to overcome dross around him even if it wasn't enough to drag them to wins but you know to, to outperform his situation and love this year i think is probably going to have a similar kind of bar it's like look rogers just left we're not expecting you to make the playoffs or anything but you got to show us that you can be something going forward you've had you know enough time sitting on the bench if you come out here and you look like a lost rookie we're, we're probably out you know but it, so that's that's kind of his bar is look you have to at least look like you can be a starting quarterback. Doesn't necessarily need to be right now, but we need to be confident at the end of the year that 2024, you know, you can be a high level player. Scrappy Vikings win 11 games, extend Kirk Cousins for four more years, and then we uh, round the circles of hell. Uh, we'll see what happens, but it's I think it's an interesting division, even though it's not one that will uh, lead the NFL and wins, I think, at the end of the day. Uh, great conversation, Sam Monson. Glad to get back together with you. And I've just been observing. How about middle of summer where we're talking about moves and decisions and exciting things? How about that? Uh, I think the Vikings are going to keep us on the edges of our seat, at least for another week with Daniil Hunter. So we'll see how that goes. But I really appreciate you jumping on and uh, we will definitely talk again very soon. Sounds good. Take it easy.